doesn't affect me, it's not my business, I'm going to stay out of it. When that person can do something to change it. That's not his plan. In the first word of this verse, Waltakum, is what some of our scholars call like a polite command. It's not a fiddle amr, it's not a command, do this, do that. It's a polite command. It's a strong encouragement. Let there arise out of you a group of people, an ummah, that invites people to that which is good. And enjoins what is right and forbids what is wrong. It is those who will be successful. Part of being successful, one of the conditions of being successful is doing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this verse. The opposite of that will bring failure and loss. <laughs> Falah, you know when we call the Adan, Haya ala al falah, same root, root word, muflihun. Someone who is successful is someone who reaps the reward or the spoils of that which they've done. Someone who's able to harvest the fruits of the seeds that they've planted. Someone whose actions are consistent with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the one who is successful. That's the definition of success in Islam. A little further on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kuntum kaira ummatan ukrijat linnas. You are the best ummah ever to emerge from mankind. Ta'muluna bil ma'roof. Wa tenhawna an al munka. Wa tu'minuna bil you are the best ummah ever to come forth from mankind. You enjoy what is right. This is the same surah, number three, Ali Imran, verse number 110. You are the best ummah. Not just because you say you Muslim, not just because you say you follow, you follow Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's not what makes you the best. And the Tartib is amazing in this verse right here. You are the best, the order is amazing. You are the best ummah, the best nation ever to come forth from mankind. Because you enjoy what is right, you forbid what is wrong, and you believe in Allah. The order, that order is amazing right there. Because we know the most important thing for a Muslim is his belief. That he man. But just to show you how important in joining the right and forbidding the wrong is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that after he joining the right and forbidding the wrong in this verse. See, when Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mention things or list things, it's not a haphazard listing. It's in that order for a reason. And in this case, Allah said, you enjoy what is right, you forbid what is wrong, and you believe in Allah. You have a social responsibility. Do you know that even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he made it haram to sit in the street. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, don't sit in the roads. Like, you know how we like, we like to hang out and sit on your porch, hang out on the corner? That's how we used to do it. Not that when we say it, it's a negative connotation, but they just hang outside. The Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, but this is the only place we find that we can gather out and discuss things. We can gather together and discuss things. And so the Prophet said, well, if you must, then make sure you give the streets or the roads its rights. And one of those things, those rights that he mentioned, 
was enjoined in the right and forbidden the wrong. See, you have a social responsibility. When you come out of your house, you have to give the streets, the public, its hop. You have to give it its rights. You can't, you can tell yourself that, but in reality, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can't have blinders on. You can't see wrong going on in front of you and say, well, that ain't really my business. You can't do that as a good Muslim. And this is why you have to be careful. Let me phrase this properly. Before I say what I'm about to say, let me say this first. Knowledge. In more than one hadith, the Prophet sallam, he equated knowledge to rainwater. He equated knowledge to rainwater. And he instructed us, and I'll shake Uthman and Folio, may Allah have mercy on him. He mentioned this in his Umdat to Bayan. He paraphrased that deep. He said, knowledge is like rainwater. It makes grow whatever's there. So if you have beautiful flowers there and it rains, you're going to get more flowers. If you have weeds there in the range, you're going to get more weeds. Knowledge is the same way. If you're a coward and you get knowledge, that knowledge is going to give you more of a justification on being a coward. Why do I say this in conjunction with enjoying the right to the law? <clears throat> because if you have some knowledge, you know that there's a ruksa, there's a license, there's a dispensation, there's a way out of you enjoying the right and forbidding the wrong. You have, if you have knowledge, you know that you don't have to, or you're not supposed to enjoy the right and forbid the wrong, if you know that in your enjoying the right and forbidding the wrong will bring, up, will bring about a greater wrong that you're trying to stop. We say it again. Forbidding an evil or preventing some harm. If you know that by preventing that particular harm, your actions will lead to a bigger harm than the harm that you're trying to pre prevent, you're not supposed to do that. If you have knowledge, you know that. But if you're a coward, your psychological makeup will have you believe that any repercussion that come out of you preventing some harm is bigger than the harm that you're trying to prevent. And so you have this knowledge, so this knowledge increases the cowardice in you, so you see wrong going around you all day and you don't do nothing. Why? Because me pre preventing the harm will bring about more harm. Enjoying the right and forbidding the wrong is one of the foundational Fundamental principles of our deen, our Islam. Well, I'm going to be back here every night. Alhamdulillah. 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 Alhamdulillah, <laughs> Enjoining the right and forbidding the wrong. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said, Men ra'a minkum munqaran fa yugayirhu bi yaddi fa in lam yastati'a fa bi lisani fa in lafti fa in lam yastati'a fa bi kawbi wa dhalika adhuqul iman Whoever amongst you sees an evil, men ra'a minkum munqaran Whoever witnesses, whoever sees an evil must change it with his hands. 
In other words, you must do something about it. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lays the responsibility on us who actually witnessed the wrong to do something about it. Then he, if he is not able to do that, then with his tongue, if he's not able to do something to stop this evil, maybe he can say something that will stop the evil. And if he's not able to do that, then with his heart. Meaning he can't do or say anything about it. The least he can do is make sure his heart doesn't find contentment with that evil that he's seen. In other words, hate it in your heart. Well, that is the man, and that is the weakest of faith. That is the weakest of faith. That hadith is in Sayyid Muslim narrated by Abu Sayyid al Qudri. There's another hadith in Sayyid Muslim also dealing with enjoying the right and forbidding the wrong. And after the Prophet said pretty much the same thing, he said, other than that, there is no Iman. There is no faith. This hadith is extremely important because the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he ties in our actions or lack thereof to our Iman. And I have to clarify. I have to clarify. Because generally speaking, our faith or our Iman is in two divisions. You have the usul, the foundation, which is what we bear witness to when we take shahada, and what we try to perfect after our shahada. What is that? Our belief in Allah. Our belief in the angels, our belief in the messengers, our belief in the books, our belief in the hereafter, and our belief in the divine decree, the articles of faith, or the pillars of faith, whatever you call them, six of them, right? That's the foundation. There is no wiggle room in that. If you're deficient in one of those things, you're not a Muslim. For example, it's well known in Islam from the Quran and the Sunnah that Prophet Asa, the one in English known as Jesus, is a prophet. He's a messenger of Allah. You can't say, well, I don't believe he ever existed. I just find it funny that I don't believe he ever existed. You know, I believe in Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I believe in Moses. I believe in all these other prophets, but I don't believe in Jesus. If a person says that, he's not Muslim. Because you have to believe in all of the messengers that Allah and his messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, informed you about. You can't be a Muslim and say that, you know, I believe Allah walked on earth just like us as human beings. He manifested himself in human form. You can't say that. You can't have that belief. If you do, you're not Muslim. Even if the thing you call God walking on two feet, even if you give him the name Allah, you're not Muslim. Allah says in the Quran, Laysa kamithli he shaykh. There's nothing like him. Anything that comes to your mind, your imagination about Allah, you know Allah is vital that. Allah is other than that. So these are the foundations. We, there's no wiggle room in that. So when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in talking about enjoying the right and forbidding the wrong, when he said, and that is the weakest of faith, he was not talking about what I just mentioned. The articles of faith. We know that faith increases and decreases. It's in the hadith, Sayyid Bukhari. He's not talking about the articles of faith. He's talking about halawatul iman, the sweetness of faith. Or I like to call your himma, your desire. Because certain things we do increase and decrease our faith. See, after the foundation, all of us are going up and down, up and down in our faith. Some days you wake up, you feel like super Muslim. You want to read all the Quran, you can. You want to study. You want to make all of the sunnah. You want to make every salat in the masjid. Everything that you can think about is Islamic, you want to do it. Your iman is increased. Other days, you have to peel yourself out of the bed to make salat. You sit in, it is time for salat. You, uh, uh, you have to your, your iman is low. That goes, that's up and down. That has nothing to do with the articles or the pillars of faith. 
So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ذَلَكَ أَضُقُ man, And that is the weakest of faith. That's that second category that he was talking about. I mean, you, you right on the edge. To equate it to a meal or a plate of food, you only have the necessities. You only have the meat and, and maybe some water. You ain't got no vegetables. You ain't got no dessert. You ain't got no sides. You ain't got nothing. You just got a meal. You don't even have that. You got peanut butter and jelly. Or some ramen noodles. That's what you got. You don't even have no cheese that's mixed in it. You just got the ramen noodles. You don't even have the sauce pack. You just got the ramen noodles. That, that, when, when your faith is automatically low, you just got the articles of faith. That's all you got. I'll give you some more examples. Whoever believes in Allah in the last day, say a good word or remain silent. You know this hadith. Whoever believes in Allah in the last day, let him say a good word, remain silent. Does that hadith mean that someone that's always talking and speaks evil, that he's a, that he's a Catholic, he's not Muslim? It don't mean that. It means that his iman is low. said that left my mind. Basic idea. None of you believes until he loves for his brother, but he loves for himself. Now you know I had to come back to you about the Akihi man living in the None of you believes until he loves for his brother, but he loves for himself. Like you mean None of you believe. So if a person is stingy and he says, you know what? I want a beautiful wife, I want some money, I want to go to heaven, I want nice clothes, I want everything that's good in this life. But for you, my Muslim brother, if you get it, I'm going to be jealous of you. I don't want you to have nothing. I want you to starve. I want you. I, I, I hope you don't ever get married. I just, I just, I'm just selfish like that. That's foul. That's a foul person. But if a person thinks like that, is he a capper? No. It just means his iman is very low. His iman is weak. It's the same thing with this hadith regarding enjoining the right and forbidding the wrong. Whoever among you sees an evil should change it with his hand. And if he's not able to do that, then with his tongue. And if he's not able to do that, then with his heart. And that is the weakest of faith. Why do I mention it? We all know because our city has been trending for at least a week on the regular media and social media. Because you know, down uptown, over the hill, you know that a video circulated. You know that at this pizza restaurant, that what we saw in the video was a verbal confrontation. And the store manager grabs the black woman and appears to head brother, they fall over the table, they're on the floor, and he's yelling at her and banging her head into the floor. Over and over. I mentioned that it was being recorded. Somebody actually sat there and recorded it and watched it. And was giggling too. He said, I didn't want my piece. And there's been protests going on there ever since. And that's good. This is my hope that they shut down. And some people are like, oh man, why did you have to mention Pittsburgh? Why do you have to say it? Because it happened in Pittsburgh. What do you want me to say? Western Pennsylvania? You want me to say it? Near the Ohio River somewhere? Near the convergence of the three rivers? No, it happened in Pittsburgh. But it doesn't only happen in Pittsburgh. You can go on YouTube right now and do a search of Black women getting beat up by, by store employees. And you get a whole bunch of video. And it's always, obviously, it's video. Somebody's recording it. And the people that are recording it and everybody else are just watching it. 
I pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that no Muslim in their right mind will watch something like that. Regardless of who it's happening to. And some of you, you like to ignore the elephant in the room. Some of you, you may not mind me talking about the subject, but you don't want me to mention the race card. You cannot even really think about this subject or discuss this subject with any level of depth, depth and leave out the race card. You can't do it. Go to YouTube and show me a bunch of videos of white women getting beat up by a store employee. You won't find it. Go and show me a bunch of videos of Asian women getting beat up by a store employee. You won't find it. And any you go down the list, you won't find it. But you find a bunch of videos of black women getting beat up by store employees of various different races. That should tell you something. <clears throat> it lets you know the status of us in this society. It shows you how foul a lot of us are. That we will actually sit and watch something like that and record it and still give back those people our money. We're the only specimen of human beings that do something like that. Get abused by somebody over and over and over again and continue to give them our money. That makes absolutely no sense. I saw a video a while ago of a woman getting beat up by some Asian in the store. It was a weed shop. And she getting beat up and, 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 and all kind of stuff. And other black women just sitting there like, I don't need to hurry up so I can get my bundles. Like you don't even feel any connection. And the sad thing about it is, we so sick that when this thing first, first started happening, when it, when it first happened, a whole bunch of people said, well, you don't know what happened before the video. You, you don't know the whole story. You mean to tell me there's an excuse? There's a justification for a man headbutting another man and repeatedly ramming her head on the floor? There's an excuse for that? I worked in fast food restaurants before. I had to put people out of stores before. I never had to do all that. And I had to deal with belligerent drunk people getting them out the store. Down in Oakland, you know, that's college area. At night, people, a bunch of drunk college students down there. What you saw in that video was the pent up hatred and vitriol that that person had for what that woman represented. That's part of the elephant in the room that y'all don't want to discuss. And some of y'all probably think, oh, that's a bit of hockey. You shouldn't even talk about you talking about that. Race has no place in Islam. Well, you don't have a clue about what the Quran says. You don't even understand the Quran. But any Muslim who think that or says that, they do not understand a big portion of the Quran. You can't. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the name of Musa 136 times in the Quran. He mentions the name of Fir'aun 74 times in the Quran. Musa and Fir'aun over and over and over again. And most of us know that in the Quran, Allah describes many different times of how Fir'aun ordered the killing of the boys and letting the women live. That's in the Quran. No Muslim would deny it. What you may not know, because your knowledge of the Quran is a little bit shallow, you think race has nothing to do with, with what's going on today, and it has no place in Islam, that Fir'aun had a dream, and his advisors told him that your dream means that there's going to be a boy born from the children of Israel, and he's going to lead them, and they're going to overthrow us and kick us out of our land. You may, it may be foggy to you because this happened so many thousands of years ago. Just go to Surah Yusuf. If you know and understand Surah Yusuf, you understand how Bani Israel, the children of Israel, got to Egypt. They are a minority in Egypt. So they were there from the time of Prophet Yusuf all the way up to Moses' time. 
several, several generations. They had lived and prospered there. When you talk about children of Israel, Bani Israel, you're talking about the children, the sons, and their families of Yaqub, the 12 tribes of Jacob. Yusuf was one of his sons. Benjamin, Benjamin was one of his sons. They all moved and settled in Egypt. If you know the end of Surah, Yusuf. That's why Moses is descended from Bani Israel. He's part of Bani Israel. Aaron, Harun, Bani Israel. They descended from them. Before Moses was born, that's when Pharaoh had this dream. And so they started killing all of the boys from Bani Israel. They were targeted because of their race. It's in the Quran. It wasn't targeted because of their deen. Not at first. They were targeted because of their race. Then when Moses, Musa, got the revelation and approached Pharaoh, Pharaoh said, Uqtulu abna aladina amalu ma'abu. So reported, kill the sons of those who believe with him. So they were persecuted for two reasons, their so-called race and their beliefs. And that's why a lot, a lot of us, we, don't, we can't figure out the solution to the problem. Because the non-Muslim black people, they understand the race part, but they get away from the religion part. And us brainwashed black people who are Muslim, we understand the religion part, but we try to ignore the race part. And they're both sitting there, sitting there in the Quran. Even though race, the way we understand it, is different than it was back then. This race, the way we understand it, is a modern construct. It's new. And even really, all of humanity ain't signed on to it yet. i give you an example. In America, we are black. Black people black. Ask the brother here. Africans born and raised in Africa, they think of race as way different than ours. They look at a different tribe the way we look at a different race. Even though to us, they are all black. <laughs> Why are you tripping? Nah, they don't see it that way. That's the elephant in the room. Race, the, one, the thing that Muslims don't want to deal with. And they lie on Allah to try to make you feel guilty about dealing with what's right in front of you. They try to use verses from Surah Ujurat, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh man, how we created you from a male and a female and made you into nations and tribes so that you may know one another. Verily, the most honorable of you in the sight of Allah is he who has the most top. And so, the verse is actually saying the opposite of what they're saying it says. Nobody is saying that you're better because you're black, or you're better because you're white, or you're better because you're Arab, or you're better because you're Indian. No one's saying that. But a lot of knowledge is that in there. Yeah, you have nasi. In the kalaka na kum minta kum wa unta. O ja'awla kum shu'uban wa kaba'ila li ta'arufu. In the abramu kum in the Allahi ashkakum. O man, God recreated you from a male and a female. Who created you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, Ja'ana, well, and we and we made you Ja'ana, Shu'uban wa Kabayla. And we made you into nation of tribe. Who does we? Yaqub and the silent scientists on the island of Black Post? No! Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lead to Arabu so that you may know. What does this mean? So that you will know who's from this tribe or who's from that tribe or what kind of family they come from. Read the Tafsir. Surah Rum, Surah number 30, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that it's from amongst his signs. It's from amongst his ayat. I mean, ayatihi. It's from the signs of Allah, the differences in our colors and our languages. Don't let these people fool you. Don't ignore the elephant in the room. 
and a lot of people come to this to this country, they was brainwashed. The same one who brainwashed everybody here to hate us. I'm gonna say us if you if you're black or you identify with black. The same one who brainwash you to hate yourself, because the worst thing, the, the thing you hate the most is to see something good happen to another black person. Is the same one who brainwashed them to hate you when they get here. Talk to some of our immigrant brothers. They will tell you that they will advise in the immigration process, either officially or unofficially, stay away from them black people. Some of them were brainwashed before they got here. You cannot understand this if you don't understand Musa and Fir'aun and the social makeup of Beni Israel while they were in Egypt. We are supposed to be the cash cow of everybody else. Everybody's supposed to come here, get rich off of us, abuse us, and use us, and kick us to the curb. That's what our purpose here is supposed to be. I met a brother a long time ago from uh, Guyana. You know, Guyana, you got a lot of people with African industry, and ancestry, and Indian ancestry. He's Indian ancestry. And he was in the, in, the, in the United States for a few years, and he bumped into a Jewish person. And he was talking, he said, man, how long have you been here? Oh, three years. He said, you ain't figured it out yet? I said, what? He said, I don't understand. You, you still getting food and clothes and, and goodwill in the Salvation Army and stuff like this? You, you don't understand how this thing works yet, do you? Listen, you will sit in a store in a black neighborhood. Hmm. And that's what they're here for. You sell to them. It don't even matter how you treat them. They will buy it. You set up in their neighborhood and you achieve the American dream. This is a Muslim brother. He said that's what they told him, and he did it, and he's good. Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah, he's a Muslim brother. Alhamdulillah, he don't treat you like trash when he comes to the store. Whatever. He's one of the good Muslim brothers. These, what happened out here in Oakland, they sound like they got Turkish last names. I don't know if they're Muslim or not. And that, because we ignore the elephant in the room, because we're not socially responsible, when people do stuff like that, everybody else looks at us. When I say us, I know everybody that's watching today right here is not black. But the majority of us are here right now. They look at us and they say, okay, now, what is it? Are you want to be Arab or are you black? That's the way they look at us. Like, are you going to identify with us or are you going to ride with your Muslim brother who's just beating up on us? For us, it ain't no conflict with us. It's clear. For us who understand their deen, if he was Muslim or not, he's wrong. And if we was there, we would both put hands on him to stop him from hitting us. It's clear for us. It's only us who like to ignore the elephant in the room and act like certain things don't exist that I find ourselves, you know, in a problematic situation whenever these situations happen because we don't know who to identify with. No. So we have a social responsibility. And so if we ever witness anything that's going, going wrong, we have to step in. Because that will directly affect our iman, our faith. And if you know somebody, whether they be Muslim or non-Muslim, like if you know the dude who actually recorded that woman getting beat up like that, he needs to have a conversation with him. Because not only that, because when people see that, and they see how we respond to that, it's more easy for it to happen again. They say, they ain't going to do nothing. Next time I, I, I feel like I'm going to let off some steam, I'm going to beat up a black woman, and I know ain't nobody going to do nothing about it, even though there's a whole store full of them. And y'all may be mad for me talking about this now because some of you have been brainwashed with this fake Islam for so long, you think it's been out for me talking about it. So maybe the wall ain't come down yet. But you will understand, Allah forbid, if it happened to your wife or your mother or your daughter going into a store and somebody putting hands on her, even if she's Muslim or not, and if I stood there and said to you, after your wife or your daughter got beat up, and, and I said, well, we don't know what happened before the camera came. 
How would you feel? If I said that to you, after your non-Muslim mother got beat up in the store, I said, whoa, whoa, I don't know what happened, what happened before the video came on. If I said that to you, you remember I even said that to you, you'd be like, I ain't going to that match no more. They talking about what happened before the video came on. But you would say that because you don't know the woman. Selfish. We have a social responsibility to enjoy the right and forbid the wrong. And that's part of our deen. You can't separate it from the deen. If you separate from the, that, that from the deen, that's when we, we become failures. That's when we lose. And that's when our iman decreases. We have that bare minimum, basic, don't even want to get out of the bed to praise, salat type of deen. May Allah protect us from it.